Today's uh, bonus episode is office hours. Um, for the brokerage, we we opened up the shop and you could ask us anything. And so I brought on two of the founding members of the firm, uh, Dick Hester and Larry Metzing. I've known these guys for 30 years and you know they've seen an awful lot. And I think that uh, they can offer an awful lot, especially in this time of uncertainty. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation uh, of office hours with Dick Hester and Larry Metzing. Today, 80% of businesses don't sell. To be a part of the 20% that do, and at maximum value, you'll need a successful strategy. Welcome to the Defenders of Business Value podcast, where we interview today's top professional advisors who help business owners create, preserve, and most importantly, transfer value. If you want actionable tips that will increase your business value, stay tuned. The podcast starts now. Uh, good afternoon. This is Ed Meisigland. I'm the managing partner at Indiana Business Advisors, and this is our first op- office hours. And the reason we, um, we, we've been fielding a lot of calls specifically over, you know, during the time of this coronavirus mess. And, and what we've found is a lot of people have a lot of questions. So we thought we would just open, open our doors and, and answer questions as they come. So I have two of the founding partners uh, two founding partners of uh, Indiana Business Advisors, Dick Hester and Larry Metzing, and joining me. And we've got a number of questions that we're going to uh, address throughout um, uh, throughout this program. And then what we'll do is we will <clears> – it'll certainly – the if you have to leave for whatever reason, we'll have it uh, replayed. Chelsea, uh, our marketing director, will send it out to all attendees. It'll also be on our podcast. So uh, – we decided that we would use go to webinar. We wanted to preserve the the anonymity of of business owners. A lot of business owners are, are the cornerstone of our practice is confidentiality, and we don't want uh, business owners to come on a Zoom call and and be recognized by somebody else. So that's why we're doing go go to webinar, and this is uh, totally anonymous. And if you have questions throughout the Throughout our conversation, all you'll have to do is put it in the chat box and we'll get them answered. So let me introduce you to a couple couple good buddies, Larry Metzing and Dick Hester. So Larry, why don't you uh, give your 30-second uh, overview of you and and Dick do the same. Well, Ed, I would assume it's okay if I take more than 30 seconds because I'm old and the overview might be long. But anyway, I'm Larry Metzing, one of the founding partners at Indiana Business Advisors, and uh, Ed came up with this bright idea that we should have uh, open house business hours during the shutdown, which I think is a very good idea because all of us really are fielding a lot of questions, some of which revolve around the new SBA programs and how they work, and a lot of them revolve around buyers who are looking at businesses and maybe down the path and how uh, how the new SBA programs might affect them and then just general questions that everyone seems to continue to have on uh, buying or selling a business so hopefully during our open business hours today we're going to be able to answer some of your questions that's the goal anyway dick welcome thanks ed and since i'm younger than larry i'll take less than 30 seconds (laughs) as larry mentioned we founded the company over 40 years ago uh, it's really been a blessing for us all these years to help business owners get out of the business when it's time for them to retire and move on to the next phase in their life and and to help people who always wanted to be in business and be their own boss, you know, get started. So we've been very fortunate to be doing this for over 40 years. We may not have all the answers. I'm sure we don't, but we do have a lot of experiences and that we're happy to share with those who are listening today. Well, thank you. So, so do you want to, as far as the questions go, we, I mean, we, some of the attendees have already submitted some. So the, the lightning rod um, these days is, is the CARES Act and how that affects small business. So Larry, I know you've, with the deals that you have in process, you, you're knee deep in the middle of, of, of how the stimulus package is affecting deals. So can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, I think I, I talk a little bit about two of the program, well, maybe three aspects of the program, the PPP program, which is the payroll protection uh, 
program and we've got uh, some sellers, uh, most of the sellers, every everyone that we're dealing with, we pretty much told them that, uh, you know, whether they need the PPP program or not, they should at least, cons- whether they need it today or not, they should at least consider getting in line because uh, you don't you don't have to uh, you don't really have to tell them how much you want till you get to the head of the line and it's time to make the decision to actually borrow the money. Uh, but it's a basically it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to help some of the small businesses get through really really tough times. So some of the things we've been addressing are existing owners who are in the process. Uh, I've probably got seven or eight deals right now that are in process. So the question is, does the existing owner, knowing that he's going to be selling the business, maybe uh, even within the next 30 days, should he go ahead and apply for the PPP program and uh, even before the, that loan is forgiven? So there have been mixed feelings about that. Most of the people that we're dealing with have applied for the PPP program. Uh, some of them have actually gotten the funds. They've been funded. And if, as we've talked through this, if we were to close uh, before that loan is forgiven, even halfway through, we may figure out a way to prorate it between the buyer and the seller if we need to. I think the other uh, much more interesting uh, aspect is uh, those folks that have existing SBA loans today, whether it's a 7A or 504, those folks that have existing uh, SBA loans today they're going to get six months of payments forgiven, not deferred, but actually forgiven. And any loan, any SBA loan that closes between now and I think it's September 20, 27, 27, 27, yeah. any loan that closes between now and then, their first six months of payments are forgiven. Once again, uh, that's a once in a lifetime opportunity. And it really, as I pointed out to one of the buyers that's looking at closing here in the next 30 days, Uh, he's probably looking at adding to his liquidity because the business is still running. It it hasn't missed a beat. He's probably going to add over that period of time about $150,000 to his liquidity. So it really gives him a nice head start on this business. Well, the funny thing, and, and, and the, one of the challenges that we, we keep on hearing a lot about is, is, reliable information where 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 are you getting your information or i'm i mean collectively we've well we've, yeah go ahead yeah i, I it, yes in the very beginning it seemed like the guidance on the sba loans if you ask uh, one banker one day you know what's the deal on this well it's a deferred well you ask them the next day and it's actually forgiven so what i've done every time I've gone to at least three different bankers with the same question. And when I get the same three answers, I know it's probably pretty good. In addition to which we we're actually getting some of the documentation and you get the opportunity to review it yourself and interpret it. But having said that, it seems like there's constantly new guidance coming out from the SBA relative to those loans. And I think what you're going to get into down the road is today we think the forgiveness will be be based on X. I think there's an outside probability that as we get into it, they're going to learn more about the forgiveness and what should be forgiven and what shouldn't be forgiven under what circumstances, probably going to be some more guidance at that time. But at the end of the day, if you get the opportunity, you ought to get it. So you don't think that the the, the business buyers and sellers, I mean, because I'm, they're, they're making a, a fairly big risk on both on both sides. I mean, how does this unwind if it doesn't work? Obviously you can probably walk away from the deal, but if, if the, the loan or the stimulus package isn't to what they, what they anticipated, what, I mean, can you unwind it? I mean, once you get into it, can you, can you, is it like any other deal? You can put the brakes on and say, look, I'm walking away. Once you get into what, the actual transaction or the loan from the SBA? Both. I mean, obviously on the transaction, you can always walk away. I'm talking with the, with the SBA. I'm assuming it's, it's a fix to the, to the D or it's a fix to the entity, right? So can you talk a little bit? So you have an asset sale that, that, that the stimulus goes along with that entity, right? Yeah, actually, actually, I don't think it works that way. 
while the entity that exists today will sign for the SBA loan, I think it's also predicated on the business itself. So as long as the business continues, so you you may end up prorating just between the buyer and the seller. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could end up potentially prorating it, but I think, uh, as I understand it, it is applicable to the business, not necessarily to the assets or anything like that. It's applicable to the business. So when you say so if you keep those same employees and you continue paying them then it should be forgiven. Even though halfway through, you may have sold the business, as I understand it from the bankers, even though halfway through, you may so you may have sold the business to new owner, as long as you continue making the payroll to those same employees, you should qualify for forgiveness. At least that's what they're saying now. I don't think that'll change. Yeah, the important thing is to get the money in the hands of the employees. Right. So so it follows the business, not necessarily the EIN or the Fed ID, right? That's what I've been yeah. told. I got it. Well, and that that's the 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 million dollar question. What what's going to change, you know, in in the interim. So Ed, yeah. One of the other things I want to add to that because I, Larry's right on target. But I was talking with one of the lenders that we use on a regular basis the other day, because uh, I have an individual who's getting ready to write a letter of intent on a business. Now, this particular business, you know, has, re- has been considered essential. It's remained open. Uh, they have not applied for any of the, the PPP or other programs, because they haven't had to. But the question is, is talking about incentives that people ought to be thinking about or to utilize. Basically, what the banker told me is he said, you know, we're talking so much about the PPP and other programs as we should be. But there are some excellent opportunities for acquisition loans right now, much more attractive rates, more attractive terms, and particularly for businesses that have been considered essentials and aren't closed. I mean, that's part of But I think you're looking for incentives to buy. And if you're looking for a business that happens to have not had to close, or it's had minimal effect uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, it's an excellent time to apply for a small business acquisition loan. The terms and interest rates are very, very attractive. Um, so I don't I want to talk just about the PPP and some other care incentives from the CARES Act when there's some other incentives that people ought to be looking at if they want to buy a business at this point in time. Yeah, the, the a lot of the, the challenges, you know, w- w- as we talk about value and, and, and doing deals, I mean, value, the value is based on earnings, growth or risk and expectation. And right now risk is high and, and, and expectation is unknown. And so I think, and, and that's one of the things that, that, that we continue to talk about is how are we going to offset some of that risk? Um, for the the buyer because the the buyer is is faced you know no one's ever been through something like this at least to my knowledge and so you know the buyer the buyers that we're talking to uh especially on the buy on the on the buy side with uh valuation it's it's how do i quantify this risk and i I know on the podcast we've had it a number of times how do you guys think that we how do you mitigate that risk or is that the million dollar question Oh, I, I think that is certainly the million dollar question, but I think you're you're mitigating part of the risk. I mean, once again, how many times do you get an opportunity to get a loan and the bank will actually make your payments for six months? Yeah. So as I think about a few things, if I were structuring my SBA loan today and the SBA says, well, you know, we're, we're more than happy to go out 14 years on that loan, or it's just a business acquisition loan, they'll typically go out 10 years. If I were getting that business loan today, I would strongly suggest that we amortize that over seven years. And the reason being that if they're going to pay the first six months of payments, they're going to pay a lot more at, on a seven-year amortization than a 10-year amortization. Now, you know, a lot of folks like to keep that payment uh, lower, which is what a 10 year would do. But I think you do take away some of the risk mm. because you just picked yeah. up six months of liquidity. Yeah, that's a real so, good idea. I, uh, yeah. I mean, I think there are opportunities to take advantage of once again, a once in a lifetime situation. So you basically got about five months right now. If you've got something in the pipeline that you're looking at, uh, 
I think a lot of people uh, have thought that buyers would take their foot off the gas pedal right now until we see how this is all going to shake out. Uh, I would think just the opposite. I think if you got something you really like and it's a business you've been you you want to buy, I don't think you'll find a better time. Yeah. No way. No, I I agree with you on that, Larry, because I've talked to several people that I've been working with, and they're anxious to buy right now because they have experience in that industry. They know that industry. They think they mitigate the risk because of their own background and their own experience. And now it's time for them to own instead of working for somebody else. So I think that's part of the reason that the people think they can mitigate the risk because of their background and experience. And the timing's great for them to go ahead and jump in the ownership because of the financing terms that you just mentioned. Yeah. Yep. So Dick, you had, I, I know you've had to coach some of your, some of your clients that, you know, you were in, you were pretty far along in, in de- in the deal and you've had to suspend, you know, you had to put the brakes on and, and I know you have a couple deals in, in different, different phases. I mean, what are you coaching them? What are you saying to them about, you know, what happens next? Well, honestly, none of us really knows what's <laughs> going to happen next. Sure. But, as I coach, because one particular deal that you're probably referring to was really based around uh, university and colleges. And with them being closed, that basically shut off their income stream, their revenue stream. Um, my first advice was, let's don't panic. You know, uh, let's wait and see what's going to happen. Uh, you can't apply for a PPP loan, you know, keep your employees uh, employed, uh, kind of keep the the business open, even though the revenue stream isn't open, you know? And so I guess my, the biggest thing I really have shared with most of my clients at this point, let's don't panic. Uh, Let's just wait and see what's going to happen in the next few months. I mean, there's no reason to to try to shut down operations. There's no reason to just basically try to get out of leases. There's no reason to try to liquidate, you know, um, let's just take a deep breath uh, and see what happens for the next few months and take advantage of any of the stimulus opportunities that might be available to you. So do you think that, that the deal will eventually go together or, or is this a, should they anticipate plan B and C? Well, I think we should always have a plan B, you know, but to answer your question directly, I do think the deal will go together eventually, you know, cause we had a buyer who was experienced in the industry, you know, but they were affected the same way uh, because of being in that same industry. So I do think the deal will go together. Uh, I just think it'll take some time to do so. It's always good to have a plan B, even the best of times. Well, I don't know what that buzzing is, but it should be great to stop it. Um, All right. Well, we've got a a number of questions. Um, So should I be still thinking about entering the restaurant industry? And if so, what, what funds might be available? How's that for a loaded question? <laughs> so, so what do you think? Well, let's, let's just start out with the fact that entering the restaurant industry is always a risky business, always has been and always will be. The first question normally is finding a banker that will actually make uh, restaurant loans, and there are a few of them. Uh, having said that, I I don't think, I think the current circumstances dictate even significantly more risk with that particular business than maybe a lot of other businesses. And because we don't know what that industry is going to look like, you know, when we open back up, I mean, if you had capacity for 200 before and you were packed every Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, and today, uh, tomorrow, you're going to have to cut that capacity in half because of the social distancing requirement. I don't know what that's going to do. You can't double your prices and make it up in price. So I think it's, uh, I just think it's a risky time. Having said that, uh, if you've got some capital and you've got some experience, I would also say there are gonna be a lot of opportunities uh, to go into existing restaurants that went into this situation, undercapitalized, highly leveraged, and they're not going to come out of it. So there will be some acquisition opportunities. Yeah. How about you, yeah. I think your key word there, Larry, was experience. Uh, if you have if you have experience in the food and beverage industry, 
this might be an opportune time uh, for you to look at some acquisition opportunities. As Larry said, I think there's going to be a lot of the smaller mom and pop type of establishments that were undercapitalized and they probably are not going to uh, be able to reopen. So there'll be some opportunities from that standpoint to assume some leases, maybe to renegotiate those leases uh, and, and to get some good equipment. Uh, obviously, there'll be a lot of people available to be hired because there's been so many people laid off for work. I think your employment base will be, uh, you'll have a better employment base than you would have had in the past. So I think there's some opportunities, I really do, in, in this industry. But I do think it's important that you've got the experience and that you've got some working capital behind you. Because everything I'm reading, it still might be mid next year before particularly the food and beverage industry gets back to where it was almost where it was, uh, just from the standpoint of capacity, uh, not having some of the other challenges that they're going to have. I was talking to somebody yesterday about the food and beverage industry, and they were actually working with the governor's office. They were part of the restaurant association and working with the governor's office about what these new guidelines are going to be uh, come probably sometime in May. Um, and Larry was exactly right. They're talking about making sure the tables are so far apart from one another, you know, that's going to really cut down the capacity. They've talked about all the employees will be wearing uh, masks and gloves. Uh, fortunately, they not talking about patrons wearing masks and gloves because it'd be kind of hard to eat with a mask on. But I do think that uh, some of the other things that they've been talking about are really going to change that industry and change that industry for probably a good 12 months. Yeah, I mean, I think people underestimate the the level of complexity just inherent to a restaurant. I mean, you have so many moving parts from from, you know, con the controllables, you know, food and, and your other cost of goods sold, as well as each person is their own you know, I don't say risk, but you know, you have to, to manage them. And, and at all times, your, your brand, as well as your, you know, your, your income could be potentially going out the door. So it, I think it's hard to, I think the, the restaurant industry is hard in general, but I think it, even it's even more amplified now because I, I, I believe that the, um, the biggest thing that we have is, you know, who's going to buy it? I mean, the, the new, the new norm, you, you see the new, the new normal and who is, who is willing to, to buy the model has changed a little bit. You know, how many of these restaurants and, and, and uh, on the podcast last week, I mean, there was a restaurant tour that, um, you know, they, they'll never have a storefront again. They, they, they've moved to 90% of their business is now online and delivery. And, you know, it, he, I don't want to say he's missed, he hasn't missed a beat, but he's, he's doing okay. And he's sitting here saying, well, why in the world would I pay for, for that kind of storefront and the rent associated with it when I can just, you know, operate from an industrial, an industrial complex where I'm playing two, three bucks a foot and uh, you know, and then DoorDash it. So I'm, I, uh, I think it. I think the restaurant world is 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 in for a real a real change. That if you don't have, if you're not going to an ex, you know, for an experience like a, say a St. Elmo's, I think, uh, or you know, something like that. I think uh, I think there's a, a lot of, especially the eclectic restaurants. I think they're they're just going to evaporate. Yeah, you know, but again, they're. You know, it's an opportunity for somebody else, but I, I, um, I just don't. I think it really, I agree with you, Ed, 100%, but I do think it's going to be an opportunity for some people that are, are true entrepreneurs uh, that have experience in the industry. When you ask people, what's the first thing you want to do when the restrictions are lifted and the pandemic has subsided, 99% say, I want to go out to eat. I want to go to a restaurant. You know, yeah. I, I want to be able to socialize instead of social distance, yeah. you know, or social distance in a much different sense of what we've been doing. So I see what, I think there's opportunities. I do think again, from what I heard uh, the other day when I was talking to the folks that are working on what these guidelines might be that come from the governor's office, uh, there might be some capital expenditures too. Cause one of the things they were talking about is um, people ordering from tablets, mm -hmm. you know, so that you don't have, you have minimal contact with a server. Uh, they were talking about everybody going to 
paper menus that are disposed of every day, as opposed to handing you that leather bound menu that 16 other people have touched. You know, um, I also heard they were talking about uh, reservation requirements. You know, we get a reservation for an hour and then the next reservation can't be for another 15, 20 minutes because that was time set aside to sanitize yeah. before the next group comes in. So I think you're right that the, the landscape is going to change dramatically, uh, at least for a year and maybe even longer. But I still think there's some opportunities for, for people that have that experience that are going to deliver the service that people do want. That sure. No, no. They won't I, even- yeah, those, those, those. I think those businesses, the hospitality industry in general, those that that there's an experience that accompanies it, I think will be fine. But just opening your doors and you know, uh, and you know, because you you make a better sandwich, I'm I'm not certain that's uh, that's going to be uh, be viable. But but again, I I hope I hope I'm wrong. I mean that 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 employs a, a lot of people. The the problem again, it it comes back to risk. Now all of a sudden you have an entirely different model on, you know, doing business and how does that affect it? And so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I just, uh, I just don't know how you, how, how a lot of businesses, how a lot of hospitality related businesses come through this um, in the same fashion they went in and they may be different. Many of them will though. Yeah. Oh no! Sure. Many of them will because they know how to do it, yeah. and we don't. Yeah, right. Um, let me get the next question. So, so how is my selling price determined, Larry? Why don't you take that one? Go ahead. You're the valuations <laughs> guy. Well, that's true. But the so when we do when we do our work, we want to. When we go to market, we want to have the company position that it makes sense. I mean, anymore, we have um, buyers that you know that they're making an analytical decision, and they have um, advisors that are are coaching them on value, and and so we have to make um, the deal make sense to 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 outside parties. So we go through. Um, various model modeling, you know, so we look at the income asset and market approach to value. And most of the time we spend in the market approach because we want companies, um, you know, we want to look at what deals have had, you know, what deals either we've done or what deals that we know of through the various databases, you know, what was the buyer behavior toward that? And then, and then we apply um, the various multiple the multiples and to the the company's related metrics, and then we come up with what we believe is value. Now, we may not uh, the the business owner. In fact, most of the time, the business owner uh, doesn't necessarily agree with our value, um, but they understand it, and and we can go to market with whatever value we want. But at the end of the day, we know that most deals these days are going to have some level of financing. And what a company's financing is that underwriting requires a va- valuation work. So we theoretically, all of us appraisers have to we're, we're pulling from the same body of knowledge. So so we can't be to- totally out in left field on on value. It has to make sense or it'll never get it, it'll never get to to the closing. Now, having said that, I mean, that's fair market value. This is how a buyer should behave now. When we talk about the brokerage forum, you know that's an entirely different story. Where, where by virtue of the process, can you can you get a premium? And that's kind of where I'm going to segue to you, Larry. You know, I do my I do my my thing, and I give you my number. And here's here's where I believe that a buyer should come in. And now it's your turn for you to do the process and and hopefully amplify. Uh, or get a, a, a premium over and above my fair market? Well, I think the big issue is the bump in the road, and hopefully it's long-term, it turns out to be just a bump in the road with the current financial impact on a lot of businesses. I won't say even most businesses, but certainly a lot of them, and maybe it is 
half or more. Everyone's going to feel some impact of what's been going on and what's going to continue to go on. What impact is that going to have on valuation? I think at the end of the day, we typically look back at historical financial statements and cash flow and historical performance. And even when we do that, we look back at historical performance. We may adjust that historical performance, the actual financials based on, um, you know, the, the, the multiple ways that owners take uh, money out of businesses. We might do some adjustments. We might look at one-time non-recurring expenses. And we've done that in the past where uh, a company had a $50,000 legal bill last year and they never had one before that. So we're going to add that 50,000 back to the cash last year's cash flow because it was a one-time non-recurring experience. Now, is the current financial situation that we're going through a one-time non-recurring experience? Uh, we all hope that's the case. And I think when we start recasting financials after we come out of this and we have to go back and look at a company's financials over this hopefully two three four month period of time hopefully we can come up with some type of adjustment that makes up for that one-time non-recurring experience now some folks uh, aren't going to miss a beat their revenue is still coming in. They've got the same expenses. They're going to have good cash flow. And their 2020 statements are going to look as good, if not better, than 2019. So do you believe that that, that warrants a premium because they, they didn't have a bump in the road? Uh, I think the market will tell us whether that warrants a premium or not. If that's a business that is recession-proof, uh, virus-proof, and proof away from any other bad things that can happen. It, should that business uh, uh, result in a premium from a valuation standpoint? I'm going to go with yes, because anytime you come up historically with a business that's recession proof, and it's proven that over a long period of time, those businesses typically are, are sold at a somewhat of a premium, no question. So I don't know I don't know how much that premium will be at the end of the day. The market is going to set that premium. And eventually then, when you're able to look back from a valuation standpoint, you'll be able to see the premium that the market gave those particular businesses. So I think as we move forward, and we look at some businesses on an ongoing basis. We're going to have to come up with maybe some either creative ways that we can adjust the performance during this period of time. And I think there are ways to do that. Yeah. Now, the other adjustment you may have is exactly the other way. When you look at the bottom line of some of these businesses that are taking the PPP money and uh, they continued business, they continue making their payroll just like they said they would. And all of a sudden they just picked up another hundred and fifty thousand dollars. They didn't miss any payroll. They didn't miss any revenue. I think that's an adjustment the other way because that's a one time non recurring income item that you need to take out of the financials. You're not going to sell it next year based on that because it's not going to happen again. So I think there will be some creative adjustments that we'll have to do. And also for the banks when we go in for financing. Well, speaking of that, Larry, I was talking to one of our SBA lenders that we use frequently about another client of mine, uh, a buyer looking to buy a business that has been closed. You know, they're non-essential business. So I was talking to him about how is this going to be financed when we get through this? And he said he certainly can't promise what the SBA is going to do. But what he's hearing is once we reopen, if they he looks, they look at a business, the SBA, and they see, and the bankers, that within two or three months after we reopen, they kind of get back to where they were, that the SBA will probably – just kind of negate these few months uh, of this pandemic crisis. You know, I would agree. Yeah. So that's what he said. He said, I can't promise that, but that's what he believes the SBA and the lending institutions are going to be doing. As long as you get yeah. back the first two or three months after this is over, kind of where you were, they're just going to kind of negate those months during the pandemic crisis and move forward as normal. Yeah. The, so coming from the the valuation community, the new acronym is uh, EBITDAC, EB uh, earnings before interest 
depreciate or interest taxes, depreciation, amortization, and corona. And so, so that is uh, that is the new the new acronym that you should probably uh, familiarize yourself with. Um, Ebedek, I like that. Yeah, and so the valuation guys have too much time in your hands. They really do. They really do. No, we we just like acronyms. Um, <laughs> so the the thing the the challenge that we we bump into in in valuing, you know, in in this environment is number one, you don't have market data. So, so you need to evaluate whether or not, you know, how much of a p- penalty should you have um, if you've gone down and, and the likelihood that 90 days after you, you, you've been restored whole is probably unlikely. Uh, and if I'm the buyer, I'm trying to capitalize on that, that, that this isn't the same company and, and it may, perhaps hasn't been stress tested enough. Um, and therefore it warrants a, a, a penalty the same, the same way, you know, those recession proof companies, you know, all right, it's been stress test tested. Um, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to quantify that premium. And that's a, that's a both ways is a real hard undertaking. And I'm not certain that there's going for, at least for a while, that there's going to be any kind of empirical evidence that would say, you know, other than surveys, you know, I know there, there's a number of. Um, brokerage and investment banking surveys that out there that are saying, you know, you should probably anticipate a, a 10 to 25% decrease across the board. Well, I, I'm not certain that's true. Um, it may, but, but that's the only guidance that we have right now, but it's a, that's a, that is just such a, a, a big undertaking to try to quantify that at least uh, to advise buyers and sellers. Um, you guys got any thoughts on on the workaround other than point to me and say figure it out? No, only time will tell. I like to answer a point to you and let you figure it out. I, mean, <laughs> I like that answer. So, so what's what's the crystal ball? I mean, what what do you see for our industry? You've been doing it for forty years. Or you've been through recessions. You've pretty much seen nine eleven. You've seen stock market crash. So, what's the crystal ball here? relative to business brokerage or the continuation of the change of ownership of small businesses? Is that going to continue? I'm going to, I mean, is that what you're basically asking? Yeah. Um, I was, I was curious to know what, what you believe business brokerage, not necessarily the business brokerage industry, but the service we provide, what, what, what is You've been through this a few times. So what other than the pandemic? So what what is what does it look like? See, I don't I, I actually don't think there's I think once we get through the this initial portion are is something going to happen where there are going to be no more sellers and no more buyers? Well, that's not going to happen. Unfortunately, uh, demographically, whether we like it or not. Uh, when uh, Michael Hicks at Ball State tells me that 80% of all the small businesses in America are owned by baby boomers, and those baby boomers have finally now started selling those businesses, uh, we're we're not going to have a shortage for a while of businesses to buy. I think you combine that with, I believe, the SBA as a result of all that's going on right now. They've already proven beyond what I ever expected uh, as to how aggressive they can be in providing uh, financing for small businesses. So I think the SBA is going to change. I thought they were very aggressive before. I think they're going to continue to be aggressive. So there's going to be money. It's never easy money, but there's certainly going to continue to be financing for all of those transactions that are $5 million and under. Might you see the SBA even increase that? They increased that from $2 million to $5 million quite some time ago. They may increase the, the from $5 million to $10 million for SBA loans. I I don't know where that part will go, but I do know there's going to continue to be SBA loans available. The bankers love SBA loans because they make a lot of fees. So I don't see any bankers getting out of the SBA lending business for a while. So you're going to have a lot of businesses on the market. You're going to have very good financing available. I think even on the smaller businesses, there are investors equity out there that's available. Uh, and I still think 
there's not going to be a shortage of buyers. No, I agree with you, Larry. Um, you're right, Ed. Uh, Larry and I are a little bit older, so we have seen some of the economic downturn, 9-11. Uh, contrary to popular belief, we were not around during the Spanish flu, but we did see some of these other economic turndowns. <laughs> now, the bottom line is majority of people that want to sell their business, they sell it for reasons other than the fact the business isn't doing well or it's undercapitalized. They sell it because they are a retirement age. They sell it because there's an illness in their family. They sell it because of partnership dispute. A lot of reasons that people sell a business don't change because of the economic situations that we're in. Just like a lot of people who want to buy a business, it's always been the American dream and always will be. They want to work for themselves. Uh, instead of working for somebody else and somebody else tell them what they're worth, they want to work for themselves and look at the tax return at the end of the year and they know what they're worth because they think they can do it and do it better than other people. So those things will, uh, will never change. It was interesting. Uh, I was talking to a, a business owner uh, earlier this morning, actually, and he and I have been in conversations for over a year about putting his business on the market. And his biggest fear was he wasn't sure he was really ready to retire. And when he told me on the phone this morning, he goes, you know, I've been staying at home for the last month, and I don't think retirement's going to be that bad. I actually think I'm going to enjoy it. So I'm not sure that I want to return and work as hard as I have in the past. So maybe now is going to be the time to put it on the market. So, again, I think we have all those kind of emotional human reasons that people will always be at a point in their life that they want to sell or they want to buy in spite of what the economic situations may be. Yeah. I, I hear you. I, I think the, the, the big, the challenge that we collectively as an industry are facing is the business owner that has, you know, I've I lost, you know, 30% of my portfolio. I've lost 30% of the value in my company and, you know, I need to recoup that. And I'm not certain that, you know, that's what we're facing is that income replacement, you know, that income replacement value that that's hanging out there. And how, how do you, how do you reconcile the two? I'm from, from my standpoint, I'm looking at these baby boomers and saying, you know what, you're not going to get another crack at this. I mean, at some point you, you do need to get, if you're going to go on the market, now's a real good time. I mean, you know, in the next year, two years, three years, but you're not going to get another crack at, at, you know, this kind of lending or the access to capital and, and the buyers, at least I don't think so. What do you guys think? Water's, Go ahead, Dick. water's fine. Come on in. <laughs> I think the advice, you know, what's the advice today for the guy that has lost 30% of his, stock market portfolio. If you ask every, I I haven't asked every advisor out there, but I have asked multiple advisors, the ones that I've asked their, their uh, responses exactly the same. And that is stay the course, stay the course. Why is this any different than staying the course? If you're thinking about selling your business today, why would you not get started on it and stay the course? Now, eventually, you know, is that is that 30% of the stock market going to come back? I have no idea. I, if you listen to everyone, they seem to say yes. It's just a matter of when. And same way with the value on your business today. If your business has been closed for three months and you think the value has gone down, once again, stay the course. When you open back up, if within six months to a year, we're back to exactly where we were before, your value is back. Now, we all know it's going to take you six months to a year to sell your business anyway, but I mm-hmm. don't think there's anyone today that's going to be looking at a business that is going, now, are they going to want to negotiate with you and negotiate the price because of the bump in the road? Sure they are. And I think it's a matter of how we get through that. We may have to, and this is once again, where I think the SBA may change ever so slightly. They, they threw out earnouts. If you have an earnout and an SBA loan, you, you can't have earnouts and SBA loans. This may be a really good time 
for all those bankers who would like to see earnouts back in SBA loans, they should be petitioning the SBA. This is a perfect time to put an earnout back in because of the bump in the road. You know, let's let's base the future performance on what the historical performance was before we got into the pandemic. And if you come back and your revenue before was two million, this year it was only a million and a half. And a year from now, we're back at two million. Then I should be rewarded for that. I should be paid the fair price for my business. And I'm willing to take the risk because I think it's going to come back. And the buyer's willing to take the risk because if it doesn't come back, he doesn't pay for it. So earnouts would be a really good way to get through yeah. some of the, this particular bump in the road relative to valuation and risk. Right. I yeah I, I and agree. Risk and and elongating the the time that the business owner can remain with the company, I think, also would would augment or m- mitigate some of that risk. You know, right now it, it that business owner can stay a year. Well, that elongating that time, you know, I think fixes some of that problem too. <laughs> the other thing I think we ought to just talk about too, for just a second, um, Ed, as we're talking about SBA lending, because obviously there's a lot of SBA loans, a lot of SBA deals. There are still a lot of community banks, smaller banks, other banks who are doing conventional loans, you know, and depend on the type of business. And I still think those are viable options for a lot of the people uh, that we would be working with uh, our clientele's buyers and sellers. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, I think any capital capital is a plenty. So, so let's see. I don't think it. Again, if you have any questions, just go ahead and put those in the chat. Let me go double check. Um. <laughs> so. So, Dick, what? Um, I guess. What are next? What are what does the rest of 2020 look like for you guys? For you, not you, not you guys. So, I mean, what the the people that you're working with? So you're you're you do an awful lot of buy side work. I mean, what are you hearing from 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 them? What are the buyers saying? You know, again, there's different categories that we're talking about here. Uh, we're still talking about there's a number of businesses that have been essential businesses that are doing as well or do even doing better, you know, during this time period, you know, so that's one category. There's the category of the, of the businesses, you know, that are closed, you know, and they're the ones that are taking the PPP, but they're not in the food and beverage industry. So there's a good chance they're going to come back stronger than they were before in the next three to six months. And then you got the other category of the people that have really been, been, been affected by this. Uh, and a lot of that is the food and beverages we talked about earlier. And are they going to be able to rebound? You know, so you got different kind of categories. Uh, we, we also have different kinds of financing that we discussed earlier, you know, uh, during this session. So um, I see that buyers are going to, st- the ones that I've worked with, um, they're still looking to buy. Their motivation to buy hasn't changed. Um I guess some of them, their motivation may have changed a little bit because they see maybe an opportunity that they didn't have before because of this situation. And they're going to take advantage of that opportunity. You know, so um, I see what once things get reopened, you know, and and let's face it, uh, there's still going to be some trepidation uh, for those that have more consumer, direct to consumer contact with their businesses. Mm -hmm. Because there's some people that still are are going to have be leery you know, going to a restaurant, going to a retail store, going to places where there's a lot of consumer contact until there's been a vaccine that comes out for the coronavirus. But those that are more B2B type of businesses as opposed to B2C, um, they still have more safety in place than the, than the B2C folks. And I don't think you're going to see much of a difference. I think you're still going to see a lot of activity uh, in buying businesses uh, between now and the end of the year. So, so one of the questions that just came in was, how do you buy a distressed business? You guys got any thoughts on that? I mean, so, you know, financials are a mess. It's not coming back. It's predominantly an asset sale. How do you do it? Or it's pr- predominantly an, uh, an assemblage of assets. How do, how do you buy that company? What do you look for? 
Well, first of all, you you look for, do you have the capital and the experience? I mean, if you're buying a distressed business, one, hopefully you've got experience in that industry. Uh, maybe it's you, you're a turnaround specialist. I mean, it's a turnaround specialist that looks for distressed businesses anyway, and they look for them all, all the time. So do you have experience in industry? Do you have some working capital yourself to, to back that up? You know, and then obviously if you go look to look for financing, there's some conventional financing, probably the seller's going to be asked to carry some paper on that type of deal. Uh, but buying a distressed business, you know, you're, you're going to pay less, higher risk. So the bottom line, do you have the experience and the working capital to mitigate that risk? even though you're paying less for it. Yeah, that's that's always the secret sauce. Can you bring something to the equation, to that assemblage of assets? And that's really the value you're going to look at at that point in time. But if there's no business, can you really bring something to that equation that's going to make it profitable? And that's, that's the $64,000 question. That's the risk. Yeah, and and the, the real challenge that we we bump into is now the supply and demand of of used equipment so as as the failures as the failures happen and more liquidations are taking place there becomes more capital um, uh, 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 equipment that's out on the market that that innate you know that uh, suppresses value even further so that's that's one of the challenges that any buyer is going to 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 face, and I believe I mean so the mechanics of 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 buying a distressed business are the same as buying a regular business, um, but I I think you're going to see that that those assemblage of assets are moving closer to um, out of fair market value and moving closer to orderly liquidation or or forced liquidation values. So, correct, yeah. and to fan, and, and to finance that's not going to be easy because the bank. I mean, all they have to look at then is the collateral value, and if it's a bunch of used assets, it's pennies on the dollar. So financing that's going to be very difficult. Yeah, that's why I think you're really looking at some type of seller note or some kind of earn right. out with the seller from that standpoint, and it still may be worth the seller's while because. He looks at liquidating what he's going to get pennies on the dollar versus at least selling to somebody that's going to give him some kind of cash up front and then some kind of promissory note to earn out in the future still is advantageous to the seller in many cases. So since we're coming up to the top of the hour, any, uh, any final, any final thoughts from either one of you? No, I would just say that if once again, if, if you're thinking about buying you basically got five months uh, to finish that deal and, and take advantage. I mean, I'm not saying that's obviously the only motive. It should never be the only motivation for buying a business. But if you're already in the process or you've been looking or you've identified, uh, I would move that forward uh, to take advantage of that opportunity. And also, I think if you're looking at buying over the next even year or two, I think the financing is going to get even better than it has been. And it's been really good, but I, I actually think it'll be better. I think the, uh, I think the government's going to be doing anything and everything they can to prop up small business. So I, I think it's a really, really good time. So obviously that also uh, translates into a really good opportunity to sell your business too. I agree with you, Larry. My final comments, Ed, would be uh, words we used before. Stay the course. Don't panic. If you know you have the skills and ability and the attitude and the work ethic and some working capital behind you, it's a great time to go ahead and buy and fulfill your dream of owning your own business. If you were going to sell for a variety of reasons in the past, you know, whether it be it was time to retire. It was an illness in your family. Whether it was a partnership dispute, stay the course. Don't panic. It's still a good time to sell. You'll get a fair value for your business. We get a premium. Don't know. Will you have to discount it? Don't know. But you'll probably still get a fair value for the business. So stay the course. Don't panic. Yeah, and I, I think 
you know one of the one of the beauties of of, of our shop is that you know we we've, we've always been been generous with with information and and I think uh, my my parting comments is you know we've got you know 15 people that are are willing to to visit with you about what they what they see in the market and what they're experiencing on the buy and the sell side so um you know, if there's questions, if there's resources that we have available, we'll, we'll certainly make them available. Um, you know, you'll certainly know when we need to turn on the meter. But generally speaking, we are we're really generous with what what we give. And, and um, you know, we, we haven't been in 40 years. We haven't been in business 40 years in in not being generous with with our time and, and our expertise. So I hope that you. Uh, as next steps that if uh, we can come alongside and help that you reach out to us, we'll have all of this, um, this on the replay on the podcast and on the website. So thanks for joining Larry, Dick and I, and hopefully we'll uh, do this again next, next month. Thanks. Thanks, fellas. Thanks, Eddie. thanks everyone for joining. Thank you for joining us today on the Defenders of Business Value podcast. If you're preparing your business for sale now or in the future, visit www.valuebuilders.us to begin your journey to maximum maximum saleable saleable value. value. And if you want more episodes jam-packed with strategies to maximize value of your business, visit defendersofbusinessvalue.com. Better yet, subscribe now so you don't ever miss an episode. This program is copyrighted MySo Incorporated. All rights reserved.